Oh, okay. So y'all just gonna catch me eating my um my birthday strawberries, huh? Mm, delicious. I can't eat. <laughs> we are we are trying to get some things done. But thank you, Fox Soul, for the berries. Yes, yes. Um, so look, tonight we are talking about the education crisis and the pandemic and how it affects our black children. We Look, the chat is already going through it, honey. The chat is so <laughs> right now. And I didn't even think that this many people um, were trying to get in on this <laughs> educational system, but they are ready, ready. So if you want to chat live with us, we chat right back. All you have to do is uh, click into our YouTube because we're live right there and that's where you get to chat. Let's go to some of our soulmates right now. Deborah Will says, in our neighborhood, we donated laptops to students for my coworker's friend who's a school teacher. Our kids need the most assistance. I really, and Fia, I wanna talk to you about this. I'm gonna get to uh, uh, an, another soulmate here, but I, I am interested in, let's see, Lenore Lewis Foreman says, because this system doesn't care about our kids, tell the truth and stop the excuse. Okay, I'm not sure who you're responding to, Lenore, but I guess maybe you're responding to why should we black people care? And you're saying black people should care because this system doesn't care about our kids. So tell the truth and shame the devil. That's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna tell the truth and shame the devil. Um, Thea, I would like to know why is it that so many of our schools, and when I say our schools, I am referring to schools that are populated with black students. Why is it that they oftentimes need help from the outside. Like Deborah said, uh, their neighborhood had to contribute laptops. Why is it that we always need that? Or does that also ha happen in predominantly white schools? So again, I work in the inner city. And so the children I serve um, are predominantly black, black and brown children. What I would say is when you think about the beginning of the pandemic, in a matter of days, some people had a week's notice people went to full remote. It meant where you had perhaps three or four laptop carts in your school, or maybe you had 200, but you had 800 children and there was a schedule in the facility. When we go to the pandemic in full remote service, if you're not one-to-one -one for technology, you will need assistance from the system in which you work. You may also need the community to support children. And I believe that in this moment in time, the community should support schools. Schools stand in service to our children. If they require your assistance, give it to them. Provide technology, resources, donate food, give of your time if you stand outside and pass out water or resources. This is a time where the community can support the school as the school continuously supports our children. Mm, good, good. Dennis, I have to know, can you please tell yeah. me exactly what off school grounds is? <laughs> Yes, uh, off school grounds is a it's a coalition of you know of of school leaders and 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 respected educators, administrators, clinicians, legal scholars, journalists, and public officials that literally get together on a weekly basis to address issues that are that are relevant in the black and brown communities. And our focus our focus primarily is about those things that you that we're talking about today, such as you know, funding. How, how do we get more funding in our schools? Why is it that black and brown communities get less funding? And again, we just had a conversation as a, as a coalition not long ago about exactly what's taking place. And what happens is federally, you know, there's money that's, that starts in Washington. And by the time it gets to, to the inner city, it has pretty much been drained severely of the, the, the amount of money that was initially um, allotted to those schools. So, so when, when I decided to think about how do I address these issues, how do I begin the process of dealing with education reform, I felt the only way you could talk about education reform is if you bring the real key stakeholders to the table. Again, educators, the respected educators, administrators like principals, um, clinicians, legal scholars, and everybody else. But ultimately what it's about is just making sure that the betterment of, 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 of our community and the betterment of young people remains a focus in everything that we do. So All School Grounds was an idea. It was a concept initially where I felt we had to take action. Like it was a call to action for all school leaders across the globe that is willing to do something 
to make a difference. And this pandemic has shown us that, um, you know, if you don't have a crew of, 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 of you know, dedicated people behind you, it's, it's going to be extremely difficult to get the message out there. So, you know, off school grounds, obviously I got a chance Can to you be more specific, Dennis? Like uh, when I yes. say be more specific, can you tell me what, what off school grounds has done during, because you say it's a call to action. So what action yes. has off school grounds taken during this pandemic? What has happened? What have you done? Okay, great. So when, when, when we think about, you know, getting the, the conversations around what education is to this country. So we took it, we, we take a, a, a more in-depth approach to the, the, the issues that are going on in the schools. Off school grounds has collectively fed communities in Brooklyn, Newark, New Jersey, um, uh, the Bronx, all over, all over New York City. We've decided that we were going to partner with some of the other um, wireless remote, I mean, the wireless um, cell carriers out there to help get hotspots into the schools. We've actually partnered with many of the, the elected officials in New York City to actually begin to get some of those laptops in the hands of families who don't have it. Mm. Um, we've also got them at the table about having discussions about how we increase funding for all the areas that we know our children have been deficient in. So what we've done is we've actually done something about the problems. We Obviously yeah. being able to identify the problem doesn't make you an expert. Being, a, being, being aware of it and then going and do something about it is what Off School Grounds has done. Or what yeah, you have done is that they, if there's a- It's definitely the implementation and the execution that matters most. Akbar, I wanna ask you, yeah. Dennis talked about uh, the money that starts in Washington, but by the time it gets to the inner cities, you know, it, <laughs> it's a penny to a thousand. So what do we do? How do we get that money to the students in the inner cities? Um, you might be on, I'm not hearing you for some reason here. I don't think, I don't think we're hearing you, Akbar, something's going on. So I'll, until we can figure that out, I'll, I'll divert the question to uh, Dr. Adams Bass. Yeah, no. So there are a few things, that's such a large question, but I want to say that money follows the performance in public schools and the money is directed to where where it's emphasized, which is usually on test scores and performance. But we know if we take an ecological approach to children and learning, that it's more than test scores and performance. So if you're putting all your money into standardized testing and computer programs that increase children's ability to, to learn or to score high on the test versus learning, they're not, 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 they're not necessarily going to have the resources that make them a holistic student or give them a holistic opportunity or experiences. So you're going to have a school where you only have 200 laptops for 800 students. You're going to have a school that says all of our children who are performing below test school standard are going to go to this extended day or they're going to be in class where they learn to take the test. So they're not going to have access to art, to music, to any of these other resources that make them well-rounded students. There are models. There are models. And usually in districts, largest districts, there are small schools or one or two schools where you have a passionate, caring principal who's doing what needs to be done with what little they have. They're connected to the community. They're meaningful and they're demonstrated that they care about the students as human beings. Oftentimes black children are seen as less than human. There's a deficit approach to their education. So the way the money is channeled means that a, a holistic approach to resources doesn't make it to the students. We also wanna talk about the tax base. That's, you know, I mentioned that from the beginning, but we wanna talk about you know, urban environments where white flight took place. And now you have lower tax dollars where schools, uh, large institutions and companies are in those cities and they are exempt from taxes. So while they may be bartering say, we bring lots of employment to your city, but then they don't pay into the tax base that helps to support public schools that gives a one-to-one -one experience to young people. Before COVID-19, no one was thinking about net neutrality for black children. But since COVID-19, everyone's talking about net neutrality. Net neutrality was reserved for agrarian communities or reserved for businesses. People doing business online, small businesses, but net neutrality has to do with equal access to the same speed of internet, no matter where you live or how much money you make. Now that's a big conversation and we are advocating or many are advocating for 
internet to be considered a, a public utility. So there are lots of variables that are impacting how come that money looks different when it gets into environments. And we wanna talk about systemic racism. We haven't talked about that yet, but we do wanna talk about what systemic racism looks like in public schools and why, why oftentimes black children and black families seem disengaged. I, Akbar, we are coming to you, Mr. Cook, Mr. Cook. Yes, ma'am. I know, I know <laughs> Yeah. One of your things is 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 getting resources from the community and getting the community involved and getting the alumni involved. I, I want to continue to ask you the question that we left off with was that money that Dennis is talking about that that starts in Washington but ends long before we get to the inner cities. How do we get some of that money and how do you create the resources that you do? Like, what is what is the relationship between that? So, so first things first. I don't, I don't wait on anyone to save me or my kids. They, they, I, I cannot be the weakest link. So while I'm waiting for policies to change, what happened to my babies? So I go out and get it. That's first and foremost. So while I'm waiting for all of that to happen, my babies are not eating. I'm going to go to the community food banks and I'm going to get some food for them. I'm going to create my own food pantries for any of my kids, any of my community that need it. We're going to, we're going to do it. And you know, once you build it, they will come. As far as the alumni portion, my alumni has been amazing. I mean, I, th I think if more schools reach out to their alumni that are really proud of the spirit that they had when they was there, you can get so many things. When I, I, you know, we developed a laundromat in my school, first free laundromat probably in the country where we opened it up because my kids were staying home because they were being bullied and they didn't have clean clothes. Enough said, went out, spoke to my alumni, we reached out to my local energy company, got a grant, put that in there. We've done so much laundry. My attendance has, uh, has, has doubled, sometimes tripled. I mean, as far as the... Uh, I had kids that were passing away due to gun violence, right, when I first got to the school. So we had to come up with something. Again, not waiting on someone else to come save them. I had to, as in local sprinters, in lieu of the parent. So what we did was, I'm a Boys and Girls Club kid. I opened up my school Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m., and I provided a safe place. We averaged prior to COVID 350 kids every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night. And even during COVID, we made sure on Memorial Day we fed uh, I gave out 1,500 boxes of uh, fresh produce to uh, the families of 700 families. And ever since we've been in COVID, every Wednesday, every Friday, been feeding families, just taking care of that, that, that food insecurity. So, so Tammy, the big thing is, why wait on all of those things that happen when our kids are going without? So whatever it is, and you can't just fix the babies, you got to fix the parents. So in those same programs that I have, I'm also giving reentry of, uh, 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 classes and construction and anything. My, my mayor, we partnered with them. We took 25 individuals, 18 of them got jobs with the city. So it's not just the baby, because you can do all of that you want with the babies, but if you send them to a broken home, all it was was a Band-Aid. So I'm literally just figuring out whatever obstacle that's in the way of my kids being successful, and we just removing the barrier. So again, I'm not waiting for handouts. I will not project my brokenness on them. I'm going to be the change that they want to see. So that's what we've been doing. Sound like a regular Joe Clark, that's for sure. <laughs> a younger version, and that's bad. I mean, no. <laughs> I, but but here's in all seriousness, though, you're talking about laundromats. You're talking about Monday, Wednesday, Friday after school programs. Principal Cook, that's a lot of financial burden. How can you? I mean, and if you've got, you're talking about 300 and over 300 students. You alone can't manage 300 students uh, 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 half, you know, half of a week, uh, half of the time out of a week. So how do you manage that financially? So, so my alumni, I started with my alumni, right? That's first and foremost. They believed in my crazy idea and it worked. And once, once you build it, there's companies that we talked about, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Bass was talking about it. There's people that are itching to give money away. Like we tired of shipping our money and I want to be sound funny, off seeds when you got families starving in the community over from you. You just have to create a safe place where everybody see you're the village, you're the pillar in the community. I call it the oasis in the land of despair. You create that synergy and, in, and it's infectious. Love is infectious and it starts pouring in. Oprah Winfrey came to my school and gave me $500,000 to my Lights On program. That is huge. Ellen DeGeneres brought me there twice, gave me 100,000. Do you know after that, here come Procter and Gamble. Here come Arm and Ham and OxyClean. It's just like it started pouring in. So now 
I have a free store full of toiletries for my, for my, for my boys and my girls. We're talking about deodorant, feminine products. We're talking about uh, soap, toothpaste. Like, you have to consider these kids almost like they have nothing. And, and, and they're so prideful in our community where they don't even want to talk about what's going on at home. If I provide a safe place for them, they will come there, go to the store, and they don't have to worry about that. So I'm just removing any barriers that prevent them from being uh, successful. And, and all of these companies have bought in. So just build it, and they will come, Tammy. So I, all of that is honorable, Principal Cook. It's nice that Oprah chipped in. It's nice that Ellen chipped in. It's nice that the alumni chips in. But I have to say that it's completely unfair that the government itself is not providing what the schools need. So how do you handle that? So it's, it, it, it's, this is how I look at it. The next town over from me don't have the same issues. It's like everybody tries to do this cookie cutter approach. It's not that way. Everyone needs the individual learning plan. So when they give us this floor plan or this cookie cutter approach, saying that this school gets this and that school, that's not right. My kids are different. You've got to treat me. So when they give us that, it, I'm not saying it, it's not enough. I'm saying it takes that educator or that district to really figure out how to make more with less. And again, that's above my pay grade, Tammy. I can't wait on that. I'm going to do what I can to make my kids successful. If I, if I get in this, oh, I'm a victim and not a victim, my kids are going to feel that same energy and the, and the woe is me. So I'm not waiting on them. Thea, isn't it? Well, Tammy, let me, Tammy, well, Tammy, can I just say really quick, based on what Akbar was saying is, but again, I think it is our responsibility to let, to let government officials, the elected officials know that we know that the money isn't getting to us. And for us to be able to tell them that again, based on what we know we're supposed to get by way of funding, it is not getting to us dollar for dollar. So it's important that we at least make them aware of the fact that we're aware of it. And then from there, start the process of then going to them as the elected officials with other stakeholders and parents and children and other people who really wanna make a difference in this and be able to let us all go collectively and say, hey, we need something done about this. We are looking at schools that have, you know, you know, 300 kids, but only 200 got laptops. It shouldn't be that complicated if we were basically looking at this thing dollar, dollar for dollar. So it's important that we make sure that those that are releasing the funds understand that we understand that it's never really trickling down to those of us that need it the most. I wanna go to the soulmates real quickly. Um, let's see, uh, Lawrence Elliott says, Akbar Cook, lights on OSG, with a whole bunch of exclamation points. Tasha <laughs> <laughs> Hogan says, once we build it, they will come. And then I think this is Imani Nicholas who says, we will not create victim culture. And then Anisha says, talk that talk. And then we're gonna move into Lenora Lewis Foreman who says net neutrality. Most times the internet isn't connecting proper. The schools aren't set up for such a heavy mm -hmm. load. Principal, mm -hmm. we don't mm -hmm. folks, oh, hold on. Yeah. Principal, we don't folks like you in our district. I don't, I'm not sure what that, I was trying to figure out what that meant right there. We don't, we don't have folks like you. Principal, we don't have folks like you in our district is probably what that means. And Dan says, parents aren't welcome. I don't even know what that means. Parents aren't welcome. Uh, but Thea, it sounds like you want to get in on it. So I really wanted to go back to this question of net neutrality. And I, and I believe Dr. Adams Bass talked about the idea that everyone does not have access to the internet. So if you consider that if we get devices in all of our children's hand, in some of the black and brown communities in which we serve, they don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have mm -hmm. internet. Mm -hmm. So consider all of these businesses, fast food restaurants, businesses that are making lots of money in communities. All of those businesses should open up their Wi-Fi and provide Wi-Fi so that if students are going to get a cheeseburger, they're going to get a slice of pizza, they know that they can take that device with them and be present get to connect to the lessons and the learning that they need, but also just have Wi-Fi access free of charge because perhaps they don't have Wi-Fi at home. So this idea of net neutrality might be a great equalizer if we might find, create a system to hold businesses in our communities mm -hmm. accountable. How are you going to provide Wi-Fi to the community? Make it a mandate so that we know that there is access for our children. Perhaps the new administration can look into that. Dr. Adams-Bass, what exactly yeah. is 
neutrality? So I want to say a couple things. So let me answer that question first, Tammy. So net neutrality is this idea that there's one speed of internet and everyone has equal access to the internet at the same speed. So regardless of how much your monthly plan is or isn't, or how many towers are close to your neighborhood, that you can log onto the internet, the World Wide Web, and you can access resources and material uploading or download at an equal speed. And then what has happened is as mergers have come into place, telecommunications mergers have come into place, there's this idea. And if you have a cell phone plan where they'll say, you know, you have unlimited internet, but then you get the star that says during high, high, high uses time, your internet may slow. Well, if we're talking just even about home-based internet, there's this proposal that you should be able to pay to play on the internet. And so net neutrality is the push to say no, when the internet was established and publicly open to everyone, everyone had equal access to the same speed and we wanna continue to have that access because when you change the speed or access to resources, then that means that everyone is not gonna be able to say, download a large file or upload a large file or do a search very quickly, particularly students. And getting to that statement about schools, you know, does the internet work? When we're talking about old school buildings where they don't have the the optics wired into the building, this really goes back to what I said. And I I don't want to, I do want to belabor this point, that tax base, those dollars that are invested into schools infrastructure so that they can update the wiring systems so that every classroom has access to Wi-Fi when schools are open or access to ethernet. That is not happening in districts where the money is being directed to improving test scores versus infrastructure, lobbying, you know, those politicians and collaborating with the communities. I think it's a both and approach. It's not necessarily a, you know, forget about the the government. It is do what you have to do to meet that community and meet those children and meet their parents and their grandparents and their aunties and his uncles. But it's also then put some fire on the politicians, right? Regardless of what color they are, whether they're black or white or green or purple or Latino or Asian or Asian or whatever, put some fire to them to make sure that those monies are being redistributed, but also do what you need to do for students. And there's so many innovative schools like Akbar who are getting it done. They may not get the attention. It may not be elevated, but they're getting it done. We're working on a project, myself and some colleagues, around deep equity work in schools and school districts. What he's describing is deep equity work according to the needs of his community to make sure that they have a quality education, that those students can focus on learning, those parents can be relaxed and know that their kids are getting what they need when they go into that school building. But from a research perspective, when we're saying equity looks like this and it doesn't look the way Akbar has said, he said that, you know, that blueprint of this is how it should look in schools, then those schools are often omitted from the research we do, right? And so then you get these policies that mean nothing. Isn't this net neutrality thing, isn't that the antithesis to capitalism that everybody have the same bandwidth? I wouldn't call it an antithesis to capitalism because really prior to COVID-19, and I think Fia said this, the net neutrality conversation was related to capitalism. It was businesses. It was small businesses saying, listen, I don't have the same money as a Fortune 500, but in order for me to stay alive, employ people and be competitive, I need the same access as a Fortune 500 company. So it is part of a marketing or capitalism system, if you will. It's just that now we're talking about public dollars and public resources for Black students who are often looked at from a deficit approach. But if you look at this conversation in business communities, people are advocating, we need to push this net neutrality. This is what's going to help these small businesses, these Fortune 100s able to compete. But now that we're talking about it in school spaces, you may hear that term, you may not. But, you know, people like, you know, it's like, what is that? Does it matter? Do we care? Yes, we care. We do care. And it's not the antithesis. It helps move things along and information. And our students should have. And I'll say one last thing. I was working on a project when I was at University of California, Davis, looking at school districts who are doing one-to-one. Small district in Alabama. I had to fly to Atlanta, then drive to Alabama to get to the school district no internet. You know what that principal did? They got a school bus. They partnered. He got a school bus. He partnered with a business and that became the Wi-Fi hub for that community. 
Now, I'm sure he was connected in ways that we have to think about, as Akbar mentioned, but my point is that community didn't have Wi-Fi. And they then moved to one-to-one -one by getting a regular old school bus, and that became the hub in communities. Why can't that happen in urban communities?